Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. So Hello. thank you for joining us for RJ Julia's virtual event with Edward Ball and Crystal Feimster tonight. I'm just going to give a few Zoom housekeeping details as you're all connecting the audio. So you're muted right now and you will remain muted for the duration of the event. Um, for optimal viewing, you can select speaker view in the top right corner of your Zoom box. Um, please ask questions at any point via the chat box. We will get to as many as possible during the later Q&A portion of the event. Most importantly, though, don't forget to purchase a copy of Life of a Klansman at rjjulia.com. There should be a link to that popping up in the chat box shortly for you. And I'm just going to tell you a bit about our two authors that we're very lucky to have with us tonight before I let them take it away. So Edward Ball's books include The Inventor and the Tycoon and Slaves in the Family, which received the <laughs> National Book Award for Nonfiction. He has taught at Yale University and has been awarded fellowships by the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard and the New York Public Library's Coleman Center. He is also the recipient of a Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And Crystal Feimster is an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies the American Studies Program, and the History Department at Yale University. She earned her PhD in History from Princeton and her BA in History and Women's Studies from UNC Chapel Hill. She is the author of Southern Horrors, Women and the Politics of Rape and Lynching, and she is currently completing her second manuscript, Truth Be Told, Rape and Mutiny in Civil War, Louisiana. Now, as for Life of a Klansman, the Washington Post says is it is powerful, relevant, and personal one of the 10 books you should read this August. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution advises readers that outside of Faulkner, it will be hard to find a more poignant, powerful account of a white man struggling with his and his nation's past. As Edward writes in his introduction, this is a story that begins with a woman making notes and talking about family and ends with a lot of people dead in a ditch. This is a family story, yet it is not a family story wrapped in sugar the way some people like to serve them. So on that note, I'll let Edward and Crystal take it away. Hello, everybody. This is Edward Ball. Nice to be with you. I thought, and Crystal, my co-host, thought that it would be a good idea for me to talk a bit about this book, which is published tomorrow. So nobody's seen this book except for, you know, 100 reviewers and what have you. And I would like to take, you know, six or seven minutes just to summarize the book and the story and give you a sense of what is on view here. And to do that, I would like to show you a few pictures. So let's start with, okay, Edward. Okay. Is everyone able to see this uh, screen? You got it. Good deal. <clears throat> As the title, the subtitle says, this is a family history, but it's also a history with a capital H. It tries to be two things at once. This story begins in Louisiana some time ago but for me the story began in the 1960s with my family in new orleans in new orleans my mother's family lived and my father's family live in charleston south carolina i was born in savannah and raised in charleston in Savannah, in Miami, Florida, and in New Orleans. We moved around a lot. And uh, in New Orleans, my mother's family had a woman named Maud LaCorn, who was the centerpiece of the uh, family memory. And Maud LaCorn was an elderly uh, retired school teacher when I got to know her about age 10. And she was practically a Victorian personality. She had a great pile of white hair tied in a bun. 
She wore um, gingham dresses. She wore clunky black shoes. She had horn-rimmed glasses, and she was the family historian. She was a woman who never married and had no apparent partner, uh, which was the custom of that time. If you were a school teacher in the white public schools of New Orleans, um, it was customary that if you were a woman, you were unmarried. And she was the keeper of the lore of the family. And in her notes and in her stories, she spoke of her grandfather. She said, you know, the Lacorns, the Lacorns, we've been here since the early 1800s. We've been here since Napoleon's time. And the one to remember is a man named Polycarp, Constant Le Corn. Polycarp. He was my grandfather. And he was a redeemer. What was that? The redemption? The redeemers were the ones who fought to restore white authority after the Civil War. They redeemed the state from black control and put politics back into the hands of white people where it was supposed to be. Now, Polycarp Constant Le Corn, this is my Aunt Maud's grandfather, was a Confederate veteran. And he came home from the Civil War in 1865, in the spring of 1865, to find his city full up with black people and to find his street full up with black people and to find the government in the hands of the African Americans. Now, my Aunt Maud was not a woman who would have used the phrase African American. And it's too bad what he got up to with that white league. Looks like it got frozen. Have I frozen or do y'all, can you all still hear me? I'm having trouble. I can hear you. I can, you can hear, hear me? You. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I've lost my ability to control the photos, unfortunately. Okay. Abby, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. I'm not sure what to do if I can't move my pictures forward. Is it is it PowerPoint? Can you try exiting, closing out PowerPoint and restarting it? Yeah, I can try that. Now, if I jump off, let's see, stop share. If I jump off, I would, uh, would, um, yes. Well, if I, if I quit, I might lose connection with you. So if that happens, okay. I'll just call you right back and zoom up again. Okay. No worries. Then we can take it away with Crystal. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, everybody. We encountered technical difficulties. Everyone, this is a great time to put a question in the chat box for Edward and Crystal to answer during Q&A. Okay. All right, so... Edward has hopped off for a second, but I'm sure he'll be back um, free from technical difficulties in just a few minutes. So, Crystal, did you want to get started with um, what you were going to talk about? Oh, it looks like you're still muted. Hello. Oh, you're muted again. Um, okay, sorry. Can you guys hear me? 
<laughs> okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, so first of all, I just want to say it's an honor to be able to be in conversation with Edward, who is an old friend and neighbor um, in New Haven and whose work I teach. Um, and I'm going to be interested in having him talk about how this book fits with his other six books. But mostly I am interested in, and I think what all of, all of you who are going to go out and get this book are going to find is that this is a book for this time, for the moment in which we're living. And one of the things that um, Edward says in his introduction is that this is a book that many Americans could have written about their families. Um, mm. And he, oh, he's back. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to let true. him take over. Um, Ed, you there? I'm right here. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to try to pick up where I left off, and if it happens again that I get frozen, then I'll discard the uh, the images, all right? Let's try. My grandfather, Polycarp Constant Le Corne, was a redeemer. And in the redemption, re reconstruction came to an end. And it's too bad what he got up to with that White League. The White League, the only difference between the White League and the Ku Klux Klan was that the White League was not secret. And it was the White League in the Battle of September 1874 that overthrew the reconstruction government in New Orleans and restored white authority. Well, as it turns out, many years would pass after my encounters with Aunt Maud before I took serious interest in this family story. Aunt Maud dies, her papers go into the hands of my mother in New Orleans, she files them away. I go off to college. I begin life in New York and I become a journalist. And it's not until I'm in my 50s that I turn my attention to this family story. I'm interested in family history. I've written a book of family history that is about the legacy of slave ownership, slave holding or what I meant to say, or I should say, about the enslavement of other people. And in my mid-50s, this was about 2015, something explosive happened, uh, and that was um, the massacre in Charleston, South Carolina which I'm sure most of us will remember, was the day in mid-June that a 21-year-old kid went into a church called uh, Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church and killed nine people at a prayer meeting. And this was, this shook me to my fingertips and it reminded me or demonstrated to me that white supremacy in its extreme violent form was back and it was uh, expressing itself. Subsequent to that, um, there came the many um, police killings of unarmed African-American men, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling. <clears throat> and I decided that I wanted to try to tell the story of our Klansmen. And so I did. I found out that he was a man who was charged with treason 
and with violating the Ku Klux Klan Act during Reconstruction. So there was paper evidence immediately available to me that led me to some of the life and times of this man. If you look at this name, P.C. Lacorn, this is the, the indictment for treason. It's for an event in which he and a number of um, commandos uh, seized a police station uh, in an attempt to topple the Reconstruction government in New Orleans. Now, at that time, New Orleans was a city of uh, 200,000 or so. <clears throat> On the right, you'll see the old city, and to the left is the area called Bouligny, Bouligny, which was the neighborhood where the Lacorn family lived. And he was a uh, he was a simple man and a ship carpenter who lived in this neighborhood in a shotgun house and worked on barges to make his living. His wife was named Gabrielle Duchemin, and he had uh, five children um, by the time the 1860s were in full flow. He was, before the Civil War, a small-scale ensla small enslaver of people. He uh, enslaved two um, individuals, one named Ovid and the other one named Rachel, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he came home from the Civil War and like half a million other men in his position, Confederate veterans, he was full of bitterness. He joined the fire company in his neighborhood, which was called Home Hook and Ladder, and soon became involved in actions of uh, public torment of black people and white Reconstruction politicians. New Orleans, as everyone knows, is the home of Mardi Gras or Carnival. And it's not out of the question that the militias that grew out of the aftermath of uh, the Civil War, the militias that became the Ku Klux Klan commandos took their ideas of costume and disguise from some of the carnival masking that was common coin in uh, New Orleans society. In the middle of 1866, Constant and his comrades in the fire department and the police engaged in the first of many massacres of African Americans who were trying to secure the right to vote. At this building, a place called the Mechanics Institute, which was at the time the home of the legislature, the state legislature, about 200 African Americans and some of their white allies were at a meeting here to call for voting rights for uh, black men. And the mayor, the white mayor of New Orleans, sent waves of police and waves of firemen to attack the, uh, the uh, activists and their supporters in the streets. And the firemen were outside the building while the police charged in shooting people. And the firemen were uh, largely the ones who um, killed people by um, beating them to death. So in this introduction that Abby gave, it is true that this is a book, it is a family story that is not wrapped in sugar like the ones that um, people are accustomed to hearing. 
This is a representation in Harper's Magazine of this massacre of some 200 African Americans in the streets of New Orleans downtown. <clears throat> so there is no um, honor roll, if you like, of killers that survived that would allow me to determine with absolute certainty that Constant Le Corn, my grandfather's, my grandmother's grandfather, was present and active in this massacre, but the circumstantial evidence is persuasive and preponderant that convinces me that he was. He, on this day, encountered, among others, a family of an African-American man named Alfred Kapla. Alfred Kapla, who was a shoemaker and shoe seller, who had a shoe store. And Alfred Kapla, it's impossible to say whether he was personally the victim of Le Corne, but he was beaten and um, nearly killed, and his son, who was with him, was shot in the face. Now, as it turns out, <clears throat> the family of Alfred Kapla still lives in New Orleans, and I found them in an effort to try to bring the story of the Ku Klux in contact with the present in a very personal way. And I went to see them and to ask their permission to tell their story and to ask their uh, forgiveness for the extraordinary brutality and cruelty to which people like my ancestors subjected their family. This is also part of the book's story. After this massacre, the Ku Klux militias arise. Constant gets involved with several of them. The one to which he's most attached is called the Knights of the White Camellia, which is uh, the Louisiana version of the Ku Klux. The Ku Klux Klan emerges from, Miss, uh, from Tennessee in late 1866, and it flows down into Mississippi, uh, northern Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. And it's principally, in its early days, a, um, a campaign full of um, fundamentalist Protestants. And in Louisiana, as some of you may know, the northern part of the state is uh, Protestant by and large, and the southern part of the state is Catholic. So the Ku Klux, as it began spreading across the Deep South, came to a kind of uh, halt at the midpoint of the state of Louisiana. And south of the uh, city of Baton Rouge, other militias evolved that imitated the uh, behavior of Klansmen and the marauding and the night riding and the torment of African-American families. And among them was the Knights of the White Camellia. One of the heroes who faces down the Ku Klux in New Orleans is a man named Louis Charles Rougenet. He was a Creole of color who founded the first African-American newspaper in the South called the New Orleans Tribune in, uh, in the late uh, 1850s. And the New Orleans Tribune is able to publish uh, throughout um, Reconstruction, throughout the Civil War, in fact, and Reconstruction, um, and it is the only um, newspaper that opposes the um, waves of, of uh, let's say, white marauding that are being carried out by dozens of militias. And Rudeney 
is, uh, is the brother of a guy called um, Louis Baptiste Rudinet, who uh, in the middle of the, the Civil War um, goes to Washington to make the first appeal to President Lincoln for African Americans men to have the ballot. And he nearly persuades Lincoln that this is something that he should do. Ultimately, it does not come to pass until 1867. Um, he's a character in the book. <clears throat> but he is publishing his African American uh, read newspaper in a climate in which the majority press consists of papers like this, um, which are mouthpieces, explicit mouthpieces for um, a conscious uh, war of the races um, that is unfolding month by month. The Ku Klux militias do not dress in white sheets and hoods until 50 years after the Civil War. The first wave of the Ku Klux, including the Knights of the White Camellia, are uh, in gowns of their own design and in hoods and masks of their own design uh, with monstrous um, effects being the most popular. But the white, the kind of meme or um, how can we say that recognizable signature of Klan activity only arises in the 19 teens, sometime later. Oops, once again, I've, I've lost. <laughs> so I'm going to drop out of, um, of the meeting again and then return. So um, thank you all for being patient. And when I return, I will uh, stop showing pictures. All right, so Crystal, there you are. Um, okay, great. I think you had a little, a little spiel to go on as well. Yeah. Questions. No, so um, I, I wanted. I'm gonna. And one of the things that I want to talk to Everett about is, you know, why is this history relevant today, and why is family history and narrative history, what's at stake in telling these family stories, and how can we use these stories in our political moment? And I think he, you know, talked about what drew him back to these stories, talking about police brutality, thinking about how white supremacy continues to function in our society today. Um, but he's doing it in a way that I think, um, you know, I think he's, um, that this book is written in a way that's a call to action. Um, and it's a call to action for all of us, whether we're black or white to explore how we're implicated in the past, right? Um, and not just how we're implicated. And, you know, I think it's interesting and powerful that he says that he went back to ask this Black family for forgiveness, right? Um, but I think there's also a bigger question, not just around the question of forgiveness, but about what do we do today when we're confronted with white supremacist violence? Um, and how are we all implicated in that? Um, and how is it, if we own our stories, if we own our history, um, how can we mobilize that for change and for good and for social justice? Um, and so for me, it's interesting to see him um, sort of, when you read the book, you, you'll, you'll hear Ed's voice. Edward's voice is very powerful. Um, he, he does something that most historians don't do, which is he uses the I, um, and he has a conversation with himself in the text, um, thinking about, well, what would I have done 
doing reconstruction? Would I have joined the Klan? Um, and because he's trying to get us to think about the context and the world in which his family and his ancestors lived in, the environment, the political realities, and what life looked like for white people after the Civil War. Um, and so I think it's really powerful because it forces us all to ask the question, um, you know, what would we do? Um, I, you know, I think about 10 years ago, there were um, these wristbands that people wore that was like, what would Jesus do? Um, I don't know if people remember that, but I, I, I remember it. Because I remember asking people like, what is that? And, um, and as a historian, I'm always asking my students, but what would, what would you do? And that we often think that we were, everybody always thinks they would be on the right side of history, right? Um, but when you have to reckon with your family's past, um, you realize that, well, actually, circumstances may have put you on a different side of history than you would have liked to imagine yourself. That if you were born white in the South, guess what? You might most likely fought for the Confederacy. If you were born Black in the South, you were most likely a slave. So that, you know, um, Black people have to even reckon with that reality. Like, I think a lot of us would like to think that we were free um, and that we lived in the North and that our ancestors escaped. But in fact, um, you know, we are often circum we are often products of our environment, products of our family history. And I think that that's one of the things that Ed's work forces us to confront. Um, mm. I don't know if Ed is Back. Yeah, I'm back here. I'm back here. Thank you, Crystal, You're, for jumping in. And um, <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, this is family history. But I, um, as Crystal is pointing out, I try to use the story of this you know, simple white family, as they were called in their own time, petit blanc, little whites, as a, um, a doorway into, um, into a, a wider national history of white identity. Um, and in, in the professional circles of historians, this kind of book is called a micro history. A micro history is a story typically of a, uh, a working class or peasant class or enslaved um, person or family studied in um, great uh, domestic detail um, and uh, to the exclusion somewhat of storytelling about uh, national events and the flow of, of uh, national politics. <clears throat> and it's, it's an attempt to see the entire world in a single, sing, to see the, the tree of society in a single leaf. And um, so this is what Life of a Klansman tries to do. And Crystal, you're right. The question immediately presents itself to a guy like me. You know, what would you be, what would you do in uh, circumstances such as the ones faced by your, your ancestor? And I think it's, 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 uh, it, it's a little too easy to, um, to claim that, you know, I or one or we as present day Americans would have taken a noble path, uh, a higher path. I think that that's, um, that's probably um, a, a useful deception, a useful self-deception. And I began to feel, well, naturally, there's another aspect of this. We cannot, as a secular 21st century post-civil rights Americans and post-civil rights white people, we cannot assume post-civil rights African Americans 
that our identities would be intact or available to someone of our um, profile uh, in the past. <clears throat> That's also a useful self-deception. So, so these are some of the things that um, are going on in the writing of this book. So I know that we are, um, you know, we're going to open up for questions soon, but I do have a few questions that I'd, yeah. I'd love for you to um, engage. Um, and I guess the first one is, I'm curious, how do you see the Klansman as part of your larger work? Where does it fit? Uh, mm -hmm. Because this isn't the first family history that you've written of, right. of sorts. So. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, I, I honestly don't um, like people who just write about their own families. And uh, I, I fear that I've, I've uh, written, written two books now about my own family, and that's getting to be the upper limit. Um, you know, I, uh, I wrote my first book 20 years ago was called Slaves in the Family. And it told the story of my father's family in South Carolina, who were large scale enslavers of African Americans on rice plantations <clears throat> for 170 years. And it told the stories of 10 African American families from slavery to the present, whom we had, my father's family had enslaved. Uh, that was 20 years ago. So that's a decent interval. It's a decent mm -hmm. interval, 20 years. Now this story comes from my mother's family and it tells the story of, um, of not um, uh, a, uh, a propertied and um, elite white man, but a, a um, an ordinary salt of the earth man. But both this book and Slaves in the Family um, try to um, excavate the hard parts of the American story and to grapple with them, you know, um, in in direct and personal ways, uh, uh, people often have asked me, you know, why do you want to tell these stories that are so incriminating of your family identity? And I, I think that there is a value to um, truth telling about the American saga, uh, the, the reality is that the whole course of our 400 year national history is full of yeah. racial violence. So this is even that word is a euphemism, racial violence. I mean, I mean, um, murderous um, domination of people of color. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Our national narrative is full of that uh, experience. And I think that, you know, even <clears throat> this year, even this year, we seem to be in experiencing a kind of reckoning, uh, an attempt um, by millions of people to reckon with the difficult um, sub chapters of our national history. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Right. Um, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat yet. Um, Abby, if, if not, I can, I have a few other questions, but I do want to make sure that people in the, uh, in the audience have an opportunity to ask questions. Whatever you want to do, we have a couple, but. Um... Okay. Okay, I, I, you know, because I, we can answer those and then I can come back to my other questions as well if there's a gap, because I do want the folks who are, who are 
here to be able to ask Ed some questions. Is that all right with you, Edward? Yes, of course, that's fine. Okay. And then... Okay, um, so this one can go, you guys can both talk, speak to it, I think. Um, as you've drafted and revised your manuscripts over the years, are they shaped and changed by current events? <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Ed. I think this is a perfect question for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started this book about six years ago. And um, at the time, my white friends said, well, like, why do you want to write out the Q plus class? Like such a, I mean, Obama's president, you know, what is this? You're bringing a, bring back like a dead fish into the dining room. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And it seemed from my marginal personal perspective that the, um, the events of these years in this book began to harmonize with the events of the present. And I mean, if you count up in the past year alone, about 250 people have died in white supremacist mass killing in this year, in the past 12 months alone, in, in uh, mass shootings from Pittsburgh to El Paso to California to all over the place. And... Um, so, so by the time I finished this manuscript, I, I wasn't altering it to make it um, correspond to or reflect or res respond to uh, news events. But I felt as though some of the um, vignettes, some of the some plots were almost duplicated in current events. I wonder if it would be appropriate for me to read a page um, from this book so that you all can get a flavor of the, of the text. Would that be all right, Abby? That's fine with me. Are other people interested? Yeah? I see some nods, I think. Let's yeah. see. <laughs> okay. This is from... This is from the two, it's from the um, chapter about that uh, Mechanics Institute massacre that I was describing. I'll read about two minutes of material. If he is on the scene, and I believe he is, I imagine Constant must feel 20 things. Here are some emotions I think he and others in the white mob feel fear, pride, duty to power, jealousy, anger, masculine insecurity, anxiety, ambition. Maybe the gangs who do the killing feel the thing we call sadism, though the word for it does not yet exist. At bottom, under all these feelings, lies a foundation on which the 20 emotions of the hour are piled, and that is the sense of a tribe in its power acting as one. Constant Lacorn is one of my people. He is one of my family. How can I respond to the discovery of what he seemingly did? In several ways. I do not feel responsible for the crimes he seems to commit. I mean legally responsible for the reason that the living cannot control the acts of the dead. In the frame of the law, I do not feel culpable for the Mechanics Institute massacre. However, as a matter of conscience, I feel implicated. I feel associated with this cruel and merciless festival of violence. I feel a part of it. Because he acts on behalf of his family, our family, if you like, I have a feeling of wretchedness and shame. The family I share with Constant is remote. He's a great-great-grandfather of mine, and everyone has 16 great-great-grandparents, and Constant, to me, is one of those 16. Oral tradition, customs, and stories are the drivers of family identity. I have a few stories from Constant's granddaughter, my Aunt Maud. A few smooth stories are not the same as membership in a continuous family life. 
But to disavow like this is a stage of grief. To disavow is to know something is true and terrible, and yet to desire that it not be true and act as though it is false. To disavow is to push away a horror. The reality is that Constant, my grandmother's grandfather, is a murderous actor on behalf of his family, on behalf of us, and it is a vile taste in the mouth. He was a fighter for our gain, for my benefit, and to say anything else is to prevaricate. It is not a distortion to say that Constant's rampage 150 years ago helps in some impossible to measure way to clear space for the authority and comfort of whites living now, not just for me and for his 50 or 60 descendants, but for whites in general. And I feel shame about that. <clears throat> the book is not all about shame and reckoning with problematic family narratives. There's a lot of storytelling in this book about the, the uh, particular place and time of the Deep South for black people and white people and how they lived and um, and I, I would highlight that as well. Abby, do you have another question? Think, go ahead, go ahead. I think I think you raise important questions, Edward, in the sense of, you know, on the one hand, you know, I write, this is a narrative history, it's a family history, it's American history, right? And so that that shame is not yours alone, right? Because it's your family, but this is an American story, right? That we are all implicated in, right? Yeah. And that if we all believe, you know, I don't, I mean, most, people believe in the American ideas of freedom and democracy and liberty and equality that we are, there's nobody who walks, I mean, there are few, I'm sure there are some people, but most of us buy into that narrative of American history that, yeah. you know, and we want America to be all of those things, right? And so when it fails, when it doesn't live up to those ideals, right? Uh, on the one hand, it's your family, on yeah. the other hand, it's it's Americans, right? And I think that's the power of this mm. book, right? It's saying, this is my family story, but it is the American story, right? And we haven't escaped it, right? That we are all either, um, you know, losers or winners in this narrative. And mm. that it's not, um, and I think what you show, it's, it's not a progressive narrative, right? There are moments when Black people in Louisiana are the winners, right? And then there are moments when they're defeated, that the potential and the possibility of radical reconstruction, right? And, and who benefits from that? It's not just Black people, but women and poor whites, but it's upended yet again, right? Because we as an American society aren't willing to commit or to fulfill that promise of equity. And then of course your constant plays a role in that, but he's not operating in a vacuum, right? The Andrew Johnson did his part, right? He was elected president. Um, so I think that is what I think is often compelling and necessary in terms of this work. You know, when you said, well, it's probably enough of my family history, I think that this is, this family history, it does a kind of work that reminds us at what's at stake in telling these stories, right? And I think it's easier for people to understand that the past is not dead, that the history, that the clan isn't just something that was happened a long time ago, if they can see the generations and mm. um, like no, nobody, we might think of our grandfather as dead, but we understand his influence on us, right? Or on our parents. That, that's much easier to track, right? Than to think of this sort of abstract American history. And so for you to say, well, this is my story. It could be Trump's story, right? As you say in your introduction, um, but that we're all have a role to play in this in this long history. And I think you write it beautifully, that you raise questions 
um, for your audience. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your narrative voice, because just even listening to you conjure your Aunt Maude, right? Um, it, it reminded me that you have a way with words and voices, right? That in your book, you're trying to amplify as many voices as you possibly can. You amplify the white supremacists, you amplify the black family that survived. And I'm wondering, and you amplify your voice in some ways. I'm wondering if you could talk about that art or that craft um, mm. and what's at stake in the narrative voice that you choose at the end of the day for this book. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want your reader to walk, what do you want them to hear you saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would like <clears throat> to uh, uh, believe what you describe as the multiplicity of, of amplified voices is a part of, of this book. Um, I choose to use the first person singular, the word I, um, throughout this story, um, because the, uh, the, the window of the narrator is the, the most um, comfortable and, and vivid access point for a reader to enter uh, a, a history of a society long ago. Um, the, what, what the I does, the narrator voice of first person does, is allow um, a reader to identify with um, a storyteller on a kind of journey through time. And that is something that gives pleasure uh, enough to um, get you to places that are very hard to get to. So I do introduce a lot of um, stories in this book, a lot of people using the first person um, to open the door onto the life of uh, Louis Rudinet, the African-American editor, and to, you know, the life of, of um, a, a white supremacist named Alcibiade de Blanc, who was the leader of the white camellia, and to the life of, of, uh, of, of the president, uh, Andrew Johnson, and... <clears throat> And I, I think that uh, historians uh, lose something when they decline to employ uh, the, the, the personal, you know, appetites and, uh, of, of a first-person narrator. Um, Crystal, what do you think? Do you think that writing in the first person has come somewhat into, um, is it more permitted now in, uh, in his, history circles than it once was? I, I think so. I mean, I still think a lot of young scholars have to write the kind of academic book. And I think narrative history is more powerful. I, mean, I think someone like David Bly, for example, uses I in his introduction, but not- Right, not yeah, after that, text, right. right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think Southern historians have a longer tradition of using the I um, and positioning themselves yeah, um, right. within that history. And I think it's important um, because yeah. there's often this sense that history is this objective, where are these objective observers, when yeah. in fact, as I said, we're all implicated in these narratives. And the more transparent we are, I think the better. Yeah. Um, but I know Abby had another question, and I want to make sure she gets it in before we run sure. out of time. I think, yeah, we're hitting the, the end, the 8 p.m. here, um, but I did want to ask a quick one just to finish us out. So say, you know, someone in the audience orders the book and they love it and they want to read more in this vein, uh, what books do you recommend then? Well, I recommend <clears throat> the, the, um, 
co-conspirator in this talk, Crystal, she uh, I think he might have thrown it me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think he was recommending Southern Horrors. Um, I would also recommend, it's an old book, but I think it's a classic. And I, I think of Edwards Ball um, work within that vein. It's, a, it's Lillian Smith's work. Um, and she has a book called Killers of the Dream, which really sort of grapples with um, white supremacy and race relations in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and tries to show how white supremacy is not just harmful for Black people, but that it harms white people as well. I mean, she has this famous line where she says, uh, the lives of Southern children, Black and white, is written on trembling earth. And so that like, all of the things that we think go wrong or that are horrible or horrendous impact black people and white people um, in harmful ways and that white supremacy isn't just about, you know, reifying whiteness, but it's about um, keeping white people in their place as well in a particular mm -hmm. kind of place. Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I, and I, when I talked to Edward, I, I really did say to him, I felt like he was in conversation or continuing the conversation of Lillian Smith. Of Lillian work. Smith, right. Um, yeah, that's a good book. So it's I, a very good book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Edward, I think you you froze while you were about to recommend Crystal. Is that right? I was. Yes, I was. Oh, so you didn't hear that? I was uh, going to recommend that you, that you read Crystal's books, which is where I would send you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that's the perfect way to finish out the evening. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you, Edward, so much for joining us. This has been a fascinating talk. Um, sure. Everyone, the uh, link to purchase both books um, is going to be in your chat box if you haven't already seen it. Uh, but yeah, thank you for supporting independent bookstores during this crazy time. Thank you for supporting RJ Julia. And have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. And thank Kendra. you, everybody. And thanks for writing. Such thank a you all for coming. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for coming.